Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to this, the first lecture in the Commission's 2014 Workplace Relations Education Series. Uh, following the success of last year's series at uh, Melbourne University, we decided, we decided to expand the program this year. As has been mentioned, today's lecture is to be delivered by uh, Emeritus Professor Russell Lansbury on the topic of management employee communications. Uh, Russell will be well known to many of you. Um, he is, uh, as has been mentioned, an Emeritus Professor at the University of Sydney Business School and has been a senior Fulbright Fellow at Harvard and MIT. He's a past president of the International Labor and Employment Relations Association. Uh, Russell was made a general member of the Order of Australia in 2009 for service to industrial relations as an educator and researcher and to the development of human resources policies. Uh, he's also um, uh, kindly authored the first invited paper on the same topic and uh, he'll address us on how employee communications and engagement can be better integrated with employment relations and enterprise bargaining to achieve productive outcomes for organisations and the broader economy. Um, this is a timely presentation, particularly for the Commission as we're currently developing our own industry engagement strategy. Um, I'd ask you to uh, welcome Russell. He's indicated that he's happy to take questions uh, at the end, uh, so please come and address us. Well, thank you very much, Ian, and would you give me back my, uh, <laughs> my notes? <laughs> Oh, there they are. There <laughs> it's always a great start, you know, when you, uh, you look for your notes and you haven't got them. Uh, well, look, thank you very much, Ian, for your kind introduction. And uh, I'd like to also thank my colleagues at the University of Sydney, uh, who you've met, uh, Marion Baird, who's here also, and, uh, 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 and other colleagues who are here, uh, <laughs> as well as some of our students. Um, also, uh, I'd like to thank Keith Townsend uh, somewhere. He's here. Where are you, Keith? There he is over there, who uh, is from Griffith University, and you'll see that um, the uh, paper is uh, jointly badged because it was Keith who uh, initiated, I think, the idea of the invited paper series and invited me to, to write one. And I, I must admit, when I was asked to talk about employee communications, I thought, employer, employee, this is a bit uh, beyond my area of expertise. But uh, in looking into it and discussing it with colleagues and, and practitioners in the field, I realised that uh, it's part of the integrated things that we do in employment relations. And what I'd like to do today is touch on four themes. Um, firstly, to try and show how, well, I guess they're propositions really, uh, how communications, involvement, engagement really fit together and are key ingredients in employment relations. Um, and I want to connect that with the notion of uh, social and technological changes that are impacting on us in our workplaces and having quite a profound effect. Though in fact the concept of the way technology and, and social changes affect us is a very old one. And I want to connect that with uh, issues to do with communication. Um, then I want to move on uh, and I perhaps will go in, I've gone into this in more detail in the written paper than I will in the spoken one, but uh, I want to show how, in fact, uh, the Commission and uh, practitioners in the field of employment relations have been looking at this issue of communications, trying to build it into uh, a number of workplace agreements. And uh, I think there's much to be done here, there's much that has been done, but more to be done in terms of really taking these issues seriously and embedding them not just in the agreements that we sign, but also in the practices that we undertake in our organisations. And then finally, I want to uh, I want to draw upon a few examples uh, that I've had a look at in, in more detail in recent times, uh, where I think we can show that employee communication and engagement uh, is there in a number of best practice type cases, but really needs to be integrated and, and more diffused throughout our uh, public and private sector organisations as well as our, our trade unions. So um, when I was asked by Keith, I thought, this sounds familiar. And I realised that back in 
the ancient days of 1970s when I was completing my PhD. I just completed my PhD. I'd worked for three years with British Airways. And something called the Commission on Industrial Relations had been established uh, following on from the Royal Commission into, uh, into employment or into unions and, and employer associations known as the Donovan Commission. And the Commission on Industrial Relations followed that and then I think it was the, the, f the forerunner of ACAS, the, uh, the current uh, s uh, in institution in Britain that provides conciliation arbitration services. Well. I applied for a job with them and I got a, a, a part-time job and the first thing they asked me to do was write a paper on employee communications <laughs> and they sent me to a place up in York uh, which was supposed to be a best practice place and it was a printing company. Uh, it was actually owned by a, a Quaker family and the, the owner was also the president of the Employers Association so I knew I had to be very careful. Uh, but I wrote the report. I cannot find it, unfortunately. <laughs> but I, d I do remember one thing that happened there. Uh, and I went into this place, uh, spent a few, almost several days there. And the first thing I did, rather naively, was go into the printing factory area and also into the office and say to people, can you tell me something that's happened here uh, in recent times that has either improved or maybe not improved your communication? And to a person, they said, yes, the telephone. <laughs> and I thought, oh, obviously they've just put in a telephone and that, this has improved things. They said, no, no, no. We put in the telephone last year between the office and the factory and since then we've never seen these people from the factory <laughs> and they haven't seen us because it has destroyed the kind of, the social arrangements, they didn't call it that, but you know, the, the get-togethers we used to have when we had a problem, or they had a problem with us, they'd come and see us. When we had a complaint from the from the clients, we'd go and see them and so on. Now, it sounds a very banal point to make, and that is that uh, that, uh, that communications via, telecommuni uh, via technology can be positive or negative. But that simple fact I'm going to show still exists today and we are still chasing this elusive quest to improve communications. Um, of course, I, I sent this to one of my kids and she said, but Dad, you haven't mentioned Google. <laughs> they're, the, they're the typical, you know, they're the best practice kind of company these days, you know, they're written up everywhere. Last year I, I Googled Google and I found last year they were voted in Canada the best workplace and I read a testimonial from one of the employees. So I looked up Google and they have a whole I don't know if you've seen this, but if you Google Google, you'll find they have a whole series of photographs of their workplaces. And they actually have a sign saying, uh, we are the cooperative workplace. So I looked at this and I looked at an array of other things, and then I thought, I, I want to try and find a workstation. And here it was, empty. And uh, to me, this looks like the 1970s. Uh, everyone in rows and so forth. Now. Of course, if you read, and I don't want to cast aspersions on Google because I'm going to appear on some program next, in a couple of weeks' time, with a human resource manager of Google Australia. So, <laughs> any of you in the audience who know her, please, I'm not wanting to cast aspersions, but I do want to raise a question, and that is, is Google doing the kinds of things that we would like to see in the workplace? Uh, and are they actually representing themselves in, in the way that we would expect the next generation of workplaces? Because to go back in time again uh, to uh, the Tavistock Institute in Britain, uh, and it was an Australian actually, Fred, he uh, Fred Emery, I almost said Fred Hilmer, Fred Emery, <laughs> uh, along with others, Eric Trist and, uh, and others, who came up with this concept of the socio-technical system. Uh, now we have consultants calling themselves socio-technical systems consultants, but they came up with a very simple pro uh, proposition, which I think we see very much in the workplaces of today and yesterday, and that is when you introduce something like simple telephone, you can have an impact on the social system. And they found this in their early work in the mines in Britain when they introduced uh, technology and Braden and I are working in, in the mining industry these days in places like Sweden where they are automating things and there back in the in the early days of, or the post-war period 
what Emery and Trist and others found was that though they introduced these new technologies, they didn't actually get the productivity improvements. And when they went in there, they found actually the technology had destroyed the social system. And they had to rebuild social systems to ensure that the technology was integrated with the social systems or the, the way in which people work. And we found this only recently, uh, work that I did with Mark, with Mark uh, Bray, uh, in, a, in a big study we did with ABB, Asaya Brown Bavari. Uh, which is a Swiss-Swedish company. And the impact that Emery and others uh, at the Tavistock had in Britain was fairly negligible. But in Scandinavia, in the Nordic countries, they took them very seriously. And although this doesn't look a very enticing workplace, in fact, I just I looked on their pages and they only had these kind of technology things. But what they had done, and I'll go back to my other slide, is what they had done was become the best practice plant. And we looked at a dozen of these plants around the world. And this one really caught our eye and our imagination because what they had done was not just build in teams and, and, uh, and use what they called process innovation, but they had actually destroyed the factory and the, the, the office. They would actually brought them together. They didn't talk about communication, but that's what they did. They really seriously attacked the notion that workplaces should be, inter sh should be separated and, and differentiated, and they really worked very hard on integration. And this had a big impact on the communications and made them the best plant in the world uh, at the time. Sorry, going backwards uh, in time. So what we're dealing with today, of course, we're, we're told is a communications revolution. Uh, which should be improving all these things. We should be using technology in a way that really changes our workplaces, and of course in many ways we are. Uh, and social media has given opportunities for people to communicate more effectively uh, and, 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 and work in, the sit and, in work situations, but I, I was recently talking to somebody in uh, a big airline that uh, happens to have its headquarters here in Australia, and they said, you know, in the latest dispute, we've really been creamed by the unions. And I said, oh, why is that? They said, because they set up a website. They were communicating uh, using telephones and all sorts of systems, and they were getting information out to the employees before we got the information. How dare they do this? Well, again, I guess this is showing how, with astute handling of technology, we can get the information out there but it's effective leadership that needs to be combined with the, the technologies that will ensure that these things are working. And this was sent to me by a, a young friend of my, uh, my son's actually who's working in advertising and she said, hey, have a look at this. She <laughs> said, this is what we're doing these days. You know, we're communicating with people beyond the workplace uh, or beyond our social circles, but we are forgetting often to communicate which, with each other. And we use these things in a, in a way that's very inappropriate or ineffective. So I want to put the proposition to you that communications is really integrated with a, a, or inter, interlinked with a range of other things. Uh, and I've had a long, perhaps I'm a tragic in the sense that I still believe in things like employee involvement and participation. <laughs> and unfortunately, there are a few other true believers out there. And uh, one of my, a couple of our colleagues, uh, uh, actually it's a, my, probably can't read that, but uh, Adrian Wilkinson up at uh, Griffith University, a colleague of Keith's, and Mick Marchington in the UK, have come up with this very simple idea, but I think quite an interesting one, of saying, look, there's an escalator here. You know, information giving is one thing, communication is another, but we need to build all these things together. In fact, I wouldn't put them on an escalator. I'd actually integrate them in a, a sort of Venn diagram so that they all interconnect. And we don't talk about them as though they're all separate, but we, we show them to be very much integral to what we do. Now, of course, in different parts of the world, we have dealt with these things in different ways. Uh, and if we look at the European Union, in fact, the project that uh, Braden and I have been working on in the mining sector is, is, is an outcome of a European, mine, a European Union project on the mine of the future. Uh, and they have selected mines in Sweden, Finland and Poland as exemplars of what mines should be like. And interestingly, in those mines there aren't, aren't many people. They're using robotics, but they're also using people up on the surface to drive those machines. But when we went and investigated some of these things last year, 
one of the managers said to me, you know, one of the problems we've got to deal with now is that there are still people down there at the machine <coughs> level, but we've got to make sure that the people on the top who are driving these machines are connected to the people in the bottom, not just by, tele you know, not just by computers or, or telephones, but that they work together as, a, as an integrated group. Now, in the European so-called, well, I'm using the, the term coordinated market economies where there is more integration, if you like, between the social partners, the unions, the employers are much more engaged with each other. Uh, there's also a much greater emphasis on building in to European legislation uh, the requirements to have information and consultation uh, as opposed to the more liberal market economies of the Anglo-Saxon world, where we tend to say, maybe we give a little lip service to this, but we don't really integrate it within our, in, in deeply within our industrial relation systems. Now, I think along with this, we can also draw, conclude, we can draw distinctions between the ways in which people participate and communicate. And again, a very simple way of doing this is to talk about indirect and direct forms of participation, uh, and I would add communication. Because in the European case, again, I'm drawing upon examples from, from the Nordic countries, from, from Germany, um, where I have tended to spend a, a certain amount of my time, uh, we see there the, the sense, that the, the, in, the inbuilt nature of communications within the co-determination system within the Works Council idea, which I know Paul and others have, have written about, which we have kind of looked at but not embraced. And I'm not saying that we can simply import those systems, but there are elements in those systems, just like there are elements in workplace uh, activities that we can see in companies like ABB that we can and maybe in Google, I, I've yet to investigate that, but uh, in, in companies that are really trying to work on the notion that you integrate your employees, your management and your workforce in a more uh, concerted way. Um, now, I'll get this right eventually, uh, in more direct forms that we tend to also find in our workplaces where they're not built in, if you like, to the institutional arrangements, but are, are much more built into things like problem solving, teams and the like, um, these are also, of course, very legitimate and very worthwhile. Um, and we have seen through various surveys that have been done uh, through the Australian Workplace Industrial Relations Survey and hopefully through the one that, uh, that is about to commence, I think, or is underway with Fair Work Australia, that we will see that there has been a greater take-up of these types of arrangements, as we saw in the first two uh, workplace surveys, national surveys that were done uh, back over the last uh, couple of decades. But of course, these things should be complementary. It's not an either or. It's not either that we have things written into agreements or we do them somehow voluntarily, but that we somehow build a system that is, is much more integrative. Now, uh, others, again, I'm drawing upon other examples, but in the, in the UK, uh, in the Blair government, um, there was a, uh, uh, one of the last things that they did was um, commissioned a report uh, by two people, David McLeod, a former ICI executive, and Nita Clark, who'd worked in the trade unions and then with, uh, with, uh, directly for Tony Blair. They came up with this report <coughs> and they were asked to inquire how business performance and innovation could be improved. And it's a very thick report. Uh, I thank Ian for drawing my attention to it. And if you boil it down, you find that what they say, ultimately, uh, the bottom line, if you like, is that employee skills were underutilised and decision making limited, uh, which contributed to low levels of employee engagement. And they picked up this notion of engagement as a key ingredient. Uh, and they said that employee engagement occurs where employees are committed to their organisations and the goals and values. Uh, whilst at the same time these uh, engagement strategies are used not just for the benefit of the organisation uh, but also to improve people's well-being. Now to me this fits very nicely with what we are talking about in terms of employee engagement. And again if you look at the research, and I really simplified this and maybe oversimplified it, uh, you'll find that there's a whole range of things that are talked about uh, uh, that come out of the research that say these are, 
uh, are a number of things that seem to be really important in terms of getting employee engagement. And I've put up there employee communications. Uh, it's not necessarily listed as the first one, it's, but combined with employee voice, feedback, uh, sense of what it is that we're being required to do in our work, work situation, the relationships that we form with each other at work, uh, the notion that we should have an opportunity to advance in our career, and that we give people uh, power, empower people to have some, uh, some uh, control over their working lives. Now again, these are all things that were said by Fred Emery back in the early 70s in a wonderful short study that he did with Chris uh, Phillips from, from uh, the uh, uh, practitioner called Australians at Work or Living at Work, I think it was called. So we keep to, we seem to kind of have to reinvent these things or rediscover them. Um, so as I've said, I think we've, we've got the survey data there and we'll, get, we'll be getting new survey data, which I think is very important, uh, just to re-emphasize the fact that these things uh, are important. We've had, uh, I think, a degree of consensus between our political parties, between uh, uh, Labor and uh, uh, conservative sides, to say that greater involvement and participation is important and that we should do these things. But, but so far, we haven't seen much on the part of the current government. Certainly in the past, uh, Labor governments uh, supported be best practices uh, and, and these were part of the notion of uh, encouraging greater engagement. Now just recently I've been to a couple of workplaces, one of which I, I knew before, another was new to me, uh, because these were highlighted among, in, in a, a magazine that I was looking at or sent to me by the uh, um, uh, Australian Manufacturers Work Workers Union, AMWU, and they said, uh, they were saying to their members, have a look at these two organisations. These are companies with whom we have had good collaboration and uh, involvement and these are both best practice organisations and these are the things that we as a union should be promoting uh, out there in terms of our relationships uh, with employers. Now I happen to know Anchor because I had met, um, uh, oh sorry I'll mention them too. One is a machine tool uh, company, uh, been here for about 40 years and uh, is, has a great, a great reputation. It exports almost all of its products overseas. is very competitive in, in Europe, in China, in the United States. The other is a German-owned company, Heller Lighting, which has been very, uh, if you look at your lights on your car, you'll probably find that it's a, a Heller light. But more recently, they have built a, uh, a center for excellence here in Melbourne in the mining industry. So they're trying to develop their technology in mining. Now, neither of these companies go out and say we're great communicators, but when I've been in the workplace there and, had, and talked to a variety of people, this is what certainly came through. And let me just give a, a couple of illustrations. This is just to show you that although we talk about Australian manufacturing being in the doldrums, here's a manufacturer. It's quite a large manufacturer, 900, 8 to 900 employees. 75% of them are here in, in, well, in Melbourne, uh, out in Bayswater. Not very flash, you know, they're just a series of buildings. But inside those buildings, uh, as I walked around, I would find there's a PhD working with a, uh, a tradesperson, working with uh, somebody from the office, uh, developing a new piece of equipment because they make the machines that make the tools. And uh, they have been consistently number one in the world. And you can see there, they're in all sorts of things, aerospace and, uh, and so forth. And here's just a, a, a picture of their apprenticeship uh, training school. Uh, only one woman there, but still they're trying their best uh, to, to develop uh, training and, and, and they do this on their own initiative. Now, a couple of characteristics of Anchor is that it is privately owned. Uh, it's owned by two, two fellows who started the job. Uh, one who was a tradesperson, the other guy was a uh, an engineer uh, educated at Melbourne University. And they have built this company up over a 40 year period. Um, and they, they really believe in engagement. They really involve their employees, uh, not just in manufacturing, but in the design and maintenance of uh, what they're doing. And every year they, they put back 10% into R&D. And they see research and development as something that's not just done by the PhDs, but also by the, the tradespeople. 
and uh, they seek uh, uh, to integrate all, all parts of their organization. And I've got some quotes in the paper uh, from them. Hella Lighting Products uh, is, uh, as I said, a company that has mainly been known for its work in the, in the uh, car industry. But here's a, a shot from the factory um, in Moorabbin. And uh, the kind of things that they're building there, a very multicultural workforce. And uh, one that also, like Anchor, puts a lot of effort into its uh, training and development. Um, and they were proud to tell us they used, they used the global financial crisis a few years ago to, to really look at what their business was doing, to diversify. And as the uh, GM operations uh, says, you know, we involve our em employees very much in the design and development. Very similar thing to what we saw at Anchor and multi-functional uh, multi uh, teams. It is a, a, a family-owned German company and the managing director in Australia is a Finn. So again, it's drawing, I think, a lot from their European heritage, but you don't have to be European to do these things. Now, let me say a few words, uh, and I've got only got about five more minutes or so, uh, about what we're doing institutionally to try and embed these kinds of ideas. Uh, and by the way, both of those um, companies that I looked at were uh, highly unionized, uh, metal work, uh, manufacturing workers union, uh, were involved in decision making uh, voluntarily. The company had engaged and involved them in, in uh, activities that were very much like you would find, I think, in a typical a Nordic or, or German factory, even though they didn't call it a works council. But we have in uh, the Fair Work Act, and I've got it in more detail, thanks to the advice I got from some of the staff at Fair Work Australia, who drew my attention to uh, line by line to some of the uh, awards, and I've included some examples uh, of agreements in, in the paper. Uh, there are statutory uh, requirements, state and federal legislation, and a number of EB, EBAs spell out what is required in terms of communication with employees and unions, uh, in, in terms of proposed changes. But again, from what I gathered from talking to people in, in, in the, in the uh, industrial sphere, these are always not these are not always followed up. And I guess the, the trick seems to be drawing upon the case studies that we looked at is to integrate these activities, these communication. Uh, and involvement <coughs> activities into the normal operation activity. So they're not just seen as something that sits in an award or an agreement that we're required to do. Uh, and again, if you look at the literature, you'll find all sorts of uh, advice on how you might go about uh, improving communications in your workplace, not just having it in agreements and not just, if you like, building workplaces and, and teams around this. Um, but just as we do with skills, where we, where we take, undertake a skills audit to see how we are faring in terms of developing the appropriate skills, um, the suggestion uh, is made that we might audit communications, take it seriously, see that we are actually doing what the, um, what the best practice companies do uh, in terms of communicating and developing systems that enable employees to develop these. And, and one of the things that Heller had done, told us a few weeks ago, was that they had instituted a new suggestion scheme. Well, a lot of people's eyes glaze over when you hear suggestion schemes. But in fact, this was a scheme that was revamped with the union involved, and uh, they saw it as a very important initiative. Uh, and they said, but you have to redesign these things. You know, you just can't keep going with the old system, and you need to get the employees involved so that you know, these, seen, uh, these are seen to be acted on and that there is a reward system here for people's suggestions and that they can, we can go out and, and show at the end of each period what we have done with those suggestions. Um, and uh, so effective guidelines. Um, and of course, it's too often the case that these things are only implemented when there's a crisis or there's a downturn and people you know, don't have much to do, and they, they look at ways in which they can re-energize people. So I've been uh, fairly brief. Uh, there's much more detail in the paper. Uh, but let me conclude by reiterating, I guess, that I see communication, involvement, engagement as very much related to each other. Uh, they're not the same, but uh, in fact, I think each has uh, elements to bring to bear. Uh, I think that 
you know, we have got some wonderful examples, but they need to be broadened and deepened. Uh, and we need leadership, both on the employer side, where there's a union on the union side, uh, or among the workforce, uh, so that uh, people will see these things as, um, as contributing both to the production or the pr productivity in the workplace, as well as employee well-being. And it's not just something to be done in you know, manufacturing. Uh, I think it's something that we, uh, uh, I see Sonia Kim here, we have been doing some work in the, in the banking industry recently among investment banks. And again, we've seen examples, uh, both good and bad, of the way in which our big banks or our investment banks do seek to, to develop communi communications within their, uh, employ or among their employees. Uh, and that's not something that's necessarily initiated by unions, but by good human resource management. Um, and so I'd like to see more innovation, more spread of these good cases to others. I think that it's not a case of we regulate or we leave it to the parties. I think it's a, a good case in which good regulation and, and good participation, good, good voluntary activity uh, undertaken by enlightened employers uh, can pay off because uh, one can build on the other. And uh, to come back to my initial case, or my initial example, um, I think this is very much connected with the kind of social and technological changes that we're going through. Uh, the Google workplaces may be the ones of the future uh, because they are, I guess, projecting an environment where people uh, look as though they're enjoying their work, uh, where they're working at the, uh, the cutting edge, uh, where they're not necessarily in the old industrial relations paradigm, but where at least uh, uh, in their, the projection that they make uh, to the public and to their clients is that we are a workplace in which people are engaged, in which they participate, and which we uh, have very good communications. Uh, but just as Fred Emery told us way back in time, when he, in his work with the Tavistock Institute, uh, we have to be very aware that when we redesign or we uh, design new workplaces that we, we get a better fit between the social engagement, the, the social fabric of the workplace, the way people operate with each other, and the technology that obviously every day, you know, invade, I shouldn't say invade, in, in, in <laughs> we incorporate into our workplace um, as, as, a, as a means of assisting us to be uh, both more productive and uh, hopefully to um, to enhance um, what we do. So with that, perhaps uh, I'll, I'll pause so that we have <coughs> some time for questions. Thank and, you. and of course, uh, disagreement or agreement. Um, while you're formulating your questions, um, uh, if I can make two observations uh, on Russell's paper. The first was I was very taken with the slide about the smartphones. Um, last Saturday, I had a phone call from one of my daughters. Uh, we chatted for about 15 minutes about this and that. And then I asked her where she was, and she said, oh, I'm upstairs. <laughs> and when I pointed out that, uh, well, perhaps some, uh, some closer communication might be in mind, she suggested using FaceTime next time. So, um, and can I also pick up on the point about the importance of disseminating uh, these sorts of initiatives and uh, how we might more broadly publicise some of the steps that are being taken in some enterprises? Um, the Commission's very keen on doing that. Uh, in our most recent annual report, you'll see there's a reference to uh, Sydney Water and in the electricity industry and some steps that were taken around more collaborative bargaining in those areas. And we do want to develop that as a feature on our website in, uh, in the coming months. So questions for Russell? Disagreements? Different points of view? I must have excited some antagonism, surely. <laughs> Anna. Anna. So, Russell, I wonder if from your um, eons of experience, uh, both here and overseas, in working... It's a polite way of saying you've been around a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, OK. <laughs> I'm in the same generation, actually. We've been separated by a few years. Um, we've certainly been around each other for a very long time. And, and each of us, as many people here, have worked um, in organisations and with organisations that are doing extraordinary things. Um, and uh, we each, I think, um, I share your naive optimism uh, that every time I see 
um, at the replication of a number of initiatives. I think this is the moment, this is the moment when the snowball effect will occur, but it hasn't occurred. So I wonder if you can comment on, uh, without being negative, what do you think some of the obstacles to diffusion are, uh, with a view perhaps to us, uh, amongst others in the Commission, um, seeking to um, facilitate and, and uh, smooth and mm. boil the wheels mm. of removing those obstacles? Look, I, I don't have an easy answer to that, and it, I think it's it's a puzzle for many of us involved in these things, why we don't see more diffusion. Um, and there are a number of arguments that or um, suggestions that are made. Uh, one being, you know, that you don't have the commitment of uh, management often to these things, or as management changes, they they don't want to be saddled with the last set of things that the previous lot did, uh, that unions are often hesitant. And I, I know when I went into these workplaces with uh, uh, a former union official, he said, look, we're so lucky to have these two guys, these organisers here, because they're committed. A lot of the others wouldn't be. You know, they wouldn't see these as valuable. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, there is a general reluctance perhaps to see these things enshrined in legislation, uh, built into the fabric of our, uh, of our system. Uh, on the other hand, we, we do take things like occupational health and safety seriously at last, and we build in mechanisms for uh, committees and so forth, uh, but we, we just don't seem to want to go beyond that. And, um, uh, you know, I, I don't have a simple answer, but I think it's a, it's a matter of maintaining the uh, the pressure, you know, of, of saying, you know, we want to be world class. Have a look at Anchor. Why is it that they can export everything, and they can compete with the Germans? They can persuade the Americans, you know, to buy their products. It's embedded in their culture, in the way they communicate, in the way they involve their employees, the way they put money, put things back into. Uh, into R and D, and it's it's a it's a whole piece. And uh, uh, when I asked uh, the the uh, long term owner there, you know, why 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 are you alone here? And he said, Well, I don't know, but uh, some people come along here and they look at it and they find reasons why they can't do it rather than why they can do it. But others might have other ideas. Yeah. Russell, you mentioned before that enterprise agreements and awards often have requirements for communication and consultation, but they're often not followed through. Is there, even under the Fair Work Commission rules now, do you think there should be more emphasis on enforcing the current obligations as they are to en encourage communication? <laughs> I, uh, I should ask one of the enforcers here, you know, to, to comment on that. People from the Ombudsman. <laughs> Well, look, it's a good point, and I, I suppose, you know, when we come to health and safety, we do enforce these things. We say these are important. When it comes to financial issues, you know, we're probably not as good at that either, but uh, we do take those seriously. And I, I think um, maybe enforcement's the wrong word, but, but certainly um, emphasising these things and in a positive way and demonstrating how they are important ingredients, along with the other things that we accept in the workplace as being vital to um, our productivity and, and, and our success. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Russell. I mean, that was a very interesting uh, presentation. But I suppose the, the real, and it's linked to this question and statement before, I mean, what role does industrial relations legislation have in diffusing employee voice, participation, mm -hmm. communication? Yeah. Well, look, if, if, we, if we look beyond our shores, let, let's take the German situation where I, I was there last year and, and spent some time with Volkswagen, and I asked people there, you know, would you do this if you didn't have to? You know, would you have works council? I said, yes, you know, we've, we've learned, you know, that this is important. And now, having said that, I know that smallest enterprises don't have them. So, you know, it's the big enterprises that do them, and maybe that's because they have got large yeah. communications and, and, and so forth. And, uh, you know, they've had various commissions. There have been quite the Biedenkopf uh, inquiry some years back in, into this whole legislation during the coal era, I think, in, in Germany, came up with the, uh, yeah. the conclusion this has served us well. You know, we're not going to give this stuff up. Uh, it's, it's been part of our... Uh, of our um, our activities, and you may be aware that recently the UAW lost a case uh, where it tried to set up a works council in the United States, and 
it wasn't the company that uh, that that was against it. The Volkswagen said, "We think that'd be a good idea. Uh, we're not against having a works council." Uh, the union thought it was a good idea, but the politicians thought it was a very bad idea, and came out saying, "Oh, you know, who would want to come to Tennessee uh, if our state requires people to have works councils? That'd be a travesty, you know." treading on the American Constitution and all that stuff. Uh, they'd also have to change their laws, perhaps, uh, about, uh, about yellow unions and so on. But, um, you know, I think that's the only answer I can think of, and that is, and having said that, of course, in, in other countries, the Nordic countries, they don't have this legislation as, as tough. You know, they don't have, they have legislation, but it's not as, it's not as prescriptive. Uh, but they've built that over the years, you know, and, and I guess it's, again, it's something that, it doesn't happen in five minutes. Yep. So I you, as an academic, can yep. I put it to you that is it in the way that new, the, the future managers, people who are learned to be, whether it's HR managers or general managers, who come up and do their MBAs, do they learn about this kind of stuff? See, I wonder whether they, I suspect they don't. I, mean, I might be wrong, but um, I haven't done an MBA here. Because <laughs> it is partly a cultural thing. And I sort of think, you know, the managers we deal with at the Commission, a lot of them would just see... Some of them will just see this as just an imposition. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just well, if they have to do it, they have to do it. But basically, it just slows them down, mm -hmm. and they don't really need to do it. And not everyone's like this, but a lot mm -hmm. of management you feel that you know, they just they go through the motions, mm -hmm. and it doesn't really work very well. Obviously, if you're not taking it seriously, mm -hmm. and I wonder whether the way people are educated oh, yeah. to be managers sure. actually sure. has an influence. Look, I, 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 you're right. I think, no doubt about it. Uh, when we were doing this research with ABB, uh, I, I went with some Swedish guys down to Germany and they said, oh, the Germans do it so differently to us. They're very hierarchical and they have all these rules and procedures and they follow them because that's the way they are. Whereas we don't have this sort of stuff. But we're part, he said, we're part of the Dargis generation. Dargis is the uh, preschool education that has been there since uh, 30 years, 40, oh, 150 years or something. And he said, we, it's built into us at the very early age uh, that we, we work in groups and in our kindergartens, we, we learn to cooperate, we learn to share and so forth, and that's just the way we do it. Uh, and now that might be an idealised picture, because I know this thing's happening there now uh, that may be changing that, but I think it, it is, you know, it is something that is built into our, and uh, there's nothing to prevent us moving that way, and I think we are moving, perhaps that, I'd like to think we're moving that way. Education now is a lot diff more, you know, I go and pick up my, my kindergarten, uh, my, one of my grandkids from the kindergarten, and he's in there with his other playmates, you know, building something and building in cooperation. Maybe we did that in my day. I don't know. Maybe those of you who are closer to the education system, but I think that's where we have to start, you know, really basic uh, level education. And, um, uh, and I remember when I, I first went to Sweden as a graduate student, the, the academics were on strike, I and I got an apology for the professor, and I turned up at the lectures, and there were all the students, and they said, don't worry, we're organizing ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> and we all went off into syndicate groups, much as you do at Macquarie in the graduate school, and we did it ourselves. Now, I think we have changed our education system more and more in that direction. We can need to build it into the workplace a lot more. All right, thank you. I wouldn't have seen you as a strike maker, Russell. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, before uh, formally thanking Russell, can I take this opportunity to thank uh, the Sydney University uh, staff and faculty members uh, who have contributed to today, Keith Townsend, and in particular uh, two members of the Commission staff, uh, Kate Purcell and Lauren Mathis, for their assistance uh, in organising today. Uh, can I ask you to join with me in thanking Russell very much for an entertaining and enlightening presentation. Um, I look. I look forward to seeing you all. Um, we have a small gift for you, Russell. Oh, thank you. Chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> um, I look forward to seeing you all at the uh, next event and uh, from the program that looks like being the Industrial Relations Society uh, <laughs> gathering in May. Thank you very much for your attendance. <laughs>